Oh, good morning. morning. Sandra, is everything on? Excellent. Good morning, and welcome to Yoker Evangelical Church. Uh, It is a joy to have people back in the building. It really is to gather together. After 20-odd weeks of everybody sitting at home, it's lovely, even in this limited way, to be able to gather together and praise God as one. So as we begin, let's just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in praise. Lord, help us as we gather around your word of life to have ears that are ready to listen and hearts ready to be transformed. Father, as we come, we confess that this week we have not honoured you as we ought have. We confess that we have been forgetful of you. Uh, We have followed our own desires instead of what you would have us do. Lord, we pray that this morning you would grant us fellowship with yourself. We give you thanks for Jesus, your sin, your son given up on a cross for our sin. Father, we praise you that our forgetfulness, our sinfulness, it is washed clean by his blood. Lord, as we gather today to praise your name, Would you make our joy complete? Father, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, Well, as I say, it is lovely to be able to gather together in person. Um, As you'll have noticed, it is a wee bit different to how we normally do church. Um, Unfortunately, we have to wear masks during the service. Um, and stay two metres apart from each other. That is just for our safety and as a way of loving each other. We keep each other safe by obeying these guidelines so that people wouldn't get sick. So it is important that we stay two metres apart. Um, Helpfully, Greg had this pole made to remind us what two metres looks like. And as you see, I can't actually hit him with the pole. So we're fine. Um, And obviously all our regular activities are still suspended and we're not able to do things throughout the week, but we do have a prayer meeting on Zoom on Wednesday nights. Uh, So if you have a computer, if you're able to access the internet, it would be great if you could join us Wednesday at 7.30 for our Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, If you'd like the details, talk to me, talk to Greg, we'll be happy to give you them. And if you don't have a computer, Why not pray yourself? At 7.30, there will be a group of us praying together online. Even if you can't join us online, why not pray yourself as we all praise God together? Well, in our service this morning, we're going to continue looking at the book of 1 John. And so if you've brought a Bible with you, can I encourage you to open it up to 1 John. So as we continue to read through this book, last week Greg showed us that John shows us Christianity is something worth basing your life on. And as we continue reading through this letter, John shows more of what that will mean for us day to day. So we're reading from 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. 
But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet, I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Oh, we give God praise for his word. Let's continue in prayer. Lord, you who are all light, be with us today. Father, as we read from your word, it encourages us to walk in your light. Father, help us to walk in the light. Give us a hatred of sin and a love of obedience to you. Father, we pray this morning that you would help us as we gather in this unusual way. We often don't cope with change well, but we praise you that you do not change. Father, we remember those sitting at home. Uh, Lord, all those who are struggling, those who are alone, those who are suffering. Father, would you reveal your mercy? We ask that you would give everyone assurance of your love, uh, that they might be confident, certain of your care. And Father, we pray this assurance not just for those already in the church, uh, but we pray for the many in yoga and further afield who do not know you. Lord, we pray that they would come to know you as well, and that they would come to have this certainty of who you are a certainty of your care, a certainty of your love. Father, we pray for our world. We lift it up to you. We ask that you would bring peace as only you can. Lord, we ask all this knowing that you are powerful enough to do this and so much more. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, we all like to have certainty, don't we? Certainty is a good thing. Whether you are finishing high school and waiting for your exam results, you long to have the certainty of the results in front of you. Or if your car is going in for an MOT, you long for the certainty of whether you can drive away or not, or how much it's going to cost. If you have a doctor's appointment and a test coming up, you long for the certainty of the result of that test. As human beings, we often find ambiguity uncomfortable when we don't know things. We long to know for sure what is true and what is not. And it is the same with Christianity. It is the same with our standing with Jesus. We should have certainty We need to know where we stand. John writes his letter, 1 John, so that people would know. He writes a letter that focuses on this certainty, that people could have 
confidence of their position with Jesus. To explain, John is writing to an unnamed church that seems to have gone through a really difficult time. At picking up on clues throughout the letter, it seems that there has been a church split. There was a group of believers and some of them started preaching a message that was contrary to the gospel. They started believing things that were different from what Jesus had said. And so the church split in two. People started falling away. And the people that are left in the church are feeling uncertain. They don't know whether what they believe is really the true gospel. Whether what they practice is really true Christianity. When they're hearing voices all around them that tell them otherwise. John writes his letter to give them certainty. To assure them that yes, this is what true Christianity looks like. As we saw last week... He shows that it is something to build your life on. And this is something that we need to hear as well. Uh, There is lots in our world that would seek to shake our faith. There are lots of forces in our world, media, friends, that would seek to remove our confidence in Christianity. That puts us in danger of falling away. We need this confidence about the gospel so that we won't get distracted. And in his letter, John uses powerful imagery to communicate this. He uses big pictures of opposites, light and darkness, truth and lies, love and hate, opposites that cannot mix. Just listen to how he starts in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Do you see the complete opposite? God is light. In him, no darkness at all. The two cannot mix. Like oil and water, there is no crossover in God. God uses this light language throughout the Bible to show what he is like. By definition, he is light. Therefore, darkness, the absence of light, is everything he is not. So, John shows us then we can know for certain what God is like and what he is not like. So then for us, salvation is no uncertain thing. Uh, Let's be completely clear. Everybody in this room, everybody in Glasgow in the world is either saved by the blood of Jesus or they are not. Either they are saved and will spend an eternity praising God or they are still under judgment. There is no grey areas with salvation. There is no sitting on the fence, no middle ground. And John's desire is that people reading this would know with certainty, which one they are. Uh, to explain the hats, it's like an old cowboy film. Right, I'm hoping this works. But in an old cowboy film, you knew who somebody was the second they walked onto the screen by the colour of their hat. The good guys all wore white hats and the bad guys all wore black hats. It was a really simple system to tell you straight away, is this person a good guy? Or is this person a bad guy? In a sense, there are no grey hats. John's desire is that we know for certain which hat do you wear. Are you saved or are you not? And to do this, he will put us under the light. As we've said, God is light. And to show whether our Christianity is real or fake... He will put us under that light. And this helps us to examine ourselves to see if we are genuine. Now this can be uncomfortable. In fact, we expect it to be uncomfortable. Being put under the light can be unflattering. That's why people going on TV wear so much makeup. We've made the decision not to. But normally when you go on TV... 
you get caked in makeup because the harsh studio lights reveal all your imperfections. Every mole, every spot, every wart is there for the world to see under those lights. But we are going to do that. We are going to put ourselves under these lights to see for certain, are we saved or are we not? And we're going to do this by examining ourselves with two questions that we can ask. Two questions that I want every person in this room to interrogate themselves with, to ask themselves. So the first question is, how do you feel about sin? Just leave that for a minute. How do you feel about sin? Really think about it. As we look at how we feel about sin, it will show whether we are real or fake. Uh, Like a banknote that you try and pay in a shop with that gets put under the UV light to show whether it is real or fake. This question, how do you feel about sin, will help us see. Are we the real deal or are we a fake? The question helps us to see this. And so thinking with your own answer, how do I feel about sin in your head? Let's take a look at the three way, at the three attitudes that John describes to show real or fake. The first attitude John looks at is an attitude that says, well, sin doesn't really bother me. Or perhaps some sins don't bother me. I don't really see, see sin as a big deal. I think it's a bit harsh. People just get overexcited about it. But John is clear we are fake if we walk in sin, if it doesn't bother us. Look how he talks about it in verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. If God is light, darkness is everything God is not. It is deceit, deception, lies, hurt. And if we are comfortable walking in that, it's pretty obvious that we don't have fellowship with God. Whatever we might confess with our mouths and say, if we are happy living in sin, it's a sign that we don't actually have fellowship with God. And now, to be clear, this is not a demand for perfection. This is not saying that to be a Christian, you have to be completely without sin. Actually, we'll go on to see that if you're saying that, that's also a sign that you're fake. It is not walking in sin. That word walking is important. We will all have moments where we sin, but if there are areas in your life where there is unrepentant, ongoing, unchallenged sin, that is walking in darkness. That is doing exactly what this passage warns against of walking hand in hand with sin. If you find that sin has a home in your heart, then there is a problem. So what is the answer to that then? If you find that secret sins have a hold over your life, well, John shows us in verse 7, he says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. What is the antidote to carelessness around sin? It is walking in the light. It is trusting in Jesus, his death for our good. It is trusting that his blood purifies us from all sin. We don't need to be sinless, but we need to look to the one who is. True Christians, we see, walk in the light. Whereas fakes are happy to walk in sin. Maybe your answer to how do you feel about sin is, I don't have a problem with sin. It's not an issue for me anymore. I used to be a sinner, 
but then Jesus saved me and now I am perfect. I am a Christian. The passage warns harshly that we are fake if we deny that sin is a problem. Just look at how John describes it in verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. God says that every single person born after Adam, save Jesus, is a sinner. God says that clearly in his word. If we claim to be without sin, we are calling God a liar. We are going against what his word tells us about ourselves. That is serious. But it also shows that his word is not in us. You see, as we read God's word, a Christian cannot help but see their sinfulness there. His word, the Bible, will convict us as we read it. We see just how far short we have fallen. And we see in his word that sin is a serious problem for everyone. The world can have a skewed vision of sin, where sin is only the really, really bad stuff. Stuff that you go to prison for, that's a sin. Actually, the bar set in God's word is so much higher that it is something that hounds every man, woman, and child. It is inward thoughts, motives, and attitudes that go against God's law. It is not doing the things that we ought to do. Every week, every day, our lives will sadly be marked by sin. Uh, Verse 8 captures this as well. That people will claim to be without sin. Verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So get this, this danger. That if we don't see sin in our lives, there is a real possibility that we might be fake. If we look at our lives and see no evidence of sin, you're not looking hard enough. And it might be a sign that you haven't actually understood the gospel. You haven't truly been forgiven. Uh, Charles Spurgeon tells a great story. He was a preacher way back when of meeting a man once who said, I don't sin anymore. It's simply not an issue for me. And Charles Spurgeon took his glass of water and poured it over the man's head. And so the man started spluttering and got very angry. And so Spurgeon said, that man which you thought was dead, I see he was only sleeping. The story illustrates that people who think they are without sin are deceiving themselves. So we have to become experts at spotting this in our lives. We have to learn to see where we are disobeying God. Now this will be tough. It's far easier to be complacent, uh, to not challenge sin. To not look for it because it hurts. It's much easier to live life not putting yourself under the lights. But we have to spot it. We have to become experts in our own hearts to spot the sins that live there. And in fact, John's answer to this problem of claiming to be without sin is that we have to learn to confess our sin. Um, Take a look if you've got a Bible at verses 8 to 10. So in verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, those two brackets in the middle comes the meat. It's like a sandwich or a contrast. The middle sticks out so much more because of the bad examples either side. So verse 9, set against this backdrop of claiming to be without sin, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
What a contrast that is from claiming to be without sin to actually going to God and confessing all the wrong that we have done. Now, when we use the word confession, we will, some of us, have a picture in our head of going to church, going in a little box and telling it to a minister, a priest, a human being. That is not what John is talking about here. This is not a call to start telling Greg everything you've done wrong every week. Greg can't forgive your sins. We go to the one who can forgive our sins. And look, the word confess actually has a slightly different meaning in the Bible. Rather than just being a list of everything that we've done wrong, rather than telling God what he already knows, the ways in which we have sinned, the word confess means agree with. As we come to God, we agree with him that we are sinners. We agree that his diagnosis of sinners in need of a saviour is correct as we confess our sins. That is so often forgotten as we pray. And yet, confession reminds us that we need a, a saviour. As we agree with God's diagnosis, his word points us to the one who died in our place. So, what is true Christianity then? As we ask ourselves, how do I know if I'm real or fake? How do I feel about sin? It is not claiming that sin has no hold over your life. It is not not seeing a problem with sin. What does true Christianity say? Well, it says, I know I have a problem, but I also have a great saviour. Look with me at chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. It would be lovely if we couldn't sin, but John knows that reality is not there yet. As he writes to Christians here and now, he knows that we will sin. And so as he writes that we will not sin, he gives these words of comfort. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. As we sin against God, our comfort is not that we can do better. Our comfort is that we have one right now who is pleading before the Father for our case. We have one who is arguing on our behalf. You might be familiar with the word advocate from a court where the person who is in the dock has somebody who is defending them, a lawyer, who puts out the case for why this person is not guilty but should be set free. Well, we have Jesus for that. We have the Son of God himself standing, pleading our case. He is our advocate as, as Satan accuses us of sin. He speaks on our behalf. And as he speaks on our behalf, he doesn't do what we would do. As we are accused of sin, our human temptation is to go, it's not really my fault. I was forced to do it. I was tricked. I couldn't help myself. That's what happens in an actual court when somebody is guilty. The lawyer tries to show why it's not really their fault and other things made them do it. They can't really be held guilty. They didn't know it was wrong. Jesus isn't like that. As he stands in our defense, he doesn't say, oh, they didn't know what they were doing. He says, yes. These people are sinners and they deserve judgment. But Jesus says, I have taken that judgment. They need not face that punishment because Jesus himself has already taken it. He offers up himself for our sin. Chapter 2, verse 1. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, 
but also for the sins of the whole world. He takes the punishment our sins deserve and offers to us his righteousness, freely given out of love. No need to offer anything. The work is already done. As he says in verse 2, that glorious truth, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It is not just that Jesus died for Christians in Yoker. He died for people throughout the world who believe in his blood. Now let's not misread those words. John is not saying that Jesus died so that every single person would be forgiven. We know already, having read this chapter, that it is those who have trusted in Jesus who are forgiven. When he says those for the sins of the whole world, I think John's using language he's already used. If I was to say John 3.16 to you, most of us could quote back, for God so loved, that's weird when you're all wearing masks, for God so loved the world. It's the same language. It doesn't mean everybody's saved, but it does mean people throughout our world will be saved. We are here in West Glasgow this morning, uh, but throughout the globe and throughout the day, there will be people calling on the name of Jesus, trusting in his sacrifice. That is a wonderful truth. And so as we stand forgiven, that then is our motivation not to sin. What is it that will help us not sin? John's message is not simply try harder, uh, do your best, keep working at it. John's message is you are already forgiven. You have this freedom not to sin. Go and do it. So this then is the attitude of real Christianity to sin. Confessing that it is a problem and knowing that it is there, but praising God for the forgiveness That we have in Jesus. How do you feel about sin? So the second question that we need to ask ourselves after how do you feel about sin is how do you feel about other Christians? Have a think about that for just a second. As you think about other Christians, your relationship to them, how do you feel? Uh, John's first marker of real Christianity is an attitude to sin. The second marker is seen in obedience. And chapter 2 verse 3 spells this out really clearly. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Knowing him will equal obedience. That seems simple enough. And yet for us human beings, obedience has always been an issue. Right back in the Garden of Eden when God said, don't touch that fruit. Human beings have struggled to obey God's commands. And yet John picks out obedience and particularly obedience to the command to love each other and shows us what that looks like. He shows us that obedience is a marker of real Christianity. And right away you might ask, why obedience? We've already said that a person is not saved by the things that they do. A person is saved by trusting in the blood of Jesus. So why pick on obedience if it has no power to save us? Well, it is because obedience is the fruit that proves that the root is healthy. Okay, remember that. Obedience is the fruit that proves that the root is healthy. If obedience, yeah, Um, a very kind church member this week gave me some tomatoes and they were lovely. They were full, they were red, they were good tasting. Uh, That healthy fruit was a sign that in that plant, the roots were healthy. 
The fact that I had lovely red tomatoes was a sign that on that tomato tree, bush, plant. Yep. It's a sign that on that tomato plant, there were healthy roots in the ground. So if obedience is the fruit, knowledge of forgiveness is the root. Do you see our obedience proves that the knowledge of forgiveness is there? If the tomatoes I had been given were rotten, or they didn't grow very big, calm down, that would have been a sign that the roots were unhealthy, or perhaps even that the roots weren't there. Obedience shows us that the root is there and that it is flourishing. And obedience to God, not just to the minimum, not like a teenager trying to get away with doing the least that is asked of them, Mom, I tidied my room, I kicked it all under the bed. But obedience done to the maximum out of love for God with joy. And so we are following a command, we are obeying something that has been defined by Jesus. Just listen to verse 7. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Uh, The command to love one another is a very, very old command. Um, I think one of the earliest is in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 where We read, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. One of the earliest books in the Bible. So when John says this is an old command, he means a really old command. And yet he also says it has been made new. It has been made new by Jesus' example by his example of laying down his life on the cross for our sake. You see, in his example, he completely redefines how we are to obey that command. If obeying commands is going under a limbo pole, then the simple command to love one another is reasonably doable. We would struggle, certainly, but it's doable. It's a limbo pole about that high. Can you see that at the back, about that high? Good. But Jesus' command, or Jesus' renewal of this command to follow his example, takes that limbo pole way down. To follow his example of laying down one's life for others. To devote your whole existence to other people for their sake, having no interest in your own good. That takes the limbo pole right down to there. That takes it down so low that we could never hope to get under it. No matter how much we bend and twist and flatten ourselves against the ground, we simply cannot get under. We simply cannot follow Jesus' example under our own strength. That is precisely why we need Jesus' help. John says, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining obedience to this degree it is only possible through him that is why obeying this command to love one another is an encouragement to us obeying that command proves that jesus is at work proves that we are forgiven That's why John picks on this, our love for other Christians, to show whether the root is healthy. And so this test is seen in how we feel about other Christians, whether we are obedient to the command to love one another. So I wonder, in your life, do you see a love for other saved souls? As you examine your heart and motives and deeds and thoughts, is there there a love, 
a Jesus-level love for other believers. I think John deliberately chose love as the example of obedience to pick out. If his example for obedience was something that we did privately, I think that would be easier. Loving other Christians is hard. Christians will hurt, let down and disappoint us. I'm sad to say. Uh, Unlike Jesus, other believers will disappoint us at times. That is the reality of living with human beings in a fallen world. And yet, the call goes out to Christians to love one another because Jesus has loved them. A love for other believers demonstrates that Christ is at work. It shows that the root is good. And it is shown especially when we love Christians that are different. It's easy to get on with people that are like you, that have similar interests, similar background. And yet we see this clearly when Christians love others that are so different from them. Different ages, personalities, that support different football teams or none at all. Christians from different continents, countries. Yet there is Christian unity between all these people. Because... It means less than being united in Christ. Where you were born, what you do for a job, your interests, it means less than being saved by Jesus. The the opposite is horrible. Um, We see in verse 11, But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness. And walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going. Because the darkness has blinded them. If we find not love but hate for other Christians. It's a sign that our root is bad. And that that knowledge of forgiveness has gone. If we find in our hearts no love for other Christians. No desire for them to flourish. No desire to serve them. It may be a sad sign that we are fake. Love for other Christians shows that our faith is certain. And that comes by the transformation of Jesus. We grow in love as we look to Jesus more and more. And the Spirit encourages us to grow in this. So how then can we have certainty? Certainty like exam results, an MOT or a doctor's appointment. Well, we are to examine how we feel about sin and other Christians. As we look at how we feel about sin and other Christians... Our answer will reveal to us, are we real or fake? Are we saved or not? Are we in the light or in the darkness? We can look and see the fruit of forgiveness in these. And see what it looks like to live in the light. One final thing. uh, What if you are not living in the light this morning? Perhaps there are people sitting here this morning who know that they are not saved. Maybe this passage has been a wake-up call to you. If you have been a complacent Christian, maybe this has helped you to see, actually, there are things I need to fix. I need to turn to Jesus. If you realize that you need help, there is good news. You are exactly who Jesus came to save. There is nothing more required than to look to him, our representative, our atoning sacrifice. And then we can live in the light only because he is the light and he came for us. We can be assured 
of salvation because of him and the fruit that comes through knowing him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for assurance that we can have. We praise you for Jesus' blood and the confidence it gives us that we can be saved. Father, thank you that he is our advocate, that he stands now defending us before the accusations of sin by holding up his sacrifice. Father, please would you form our attitude to sin, our attitude to other Christians. Lord, each day we pray, would you make us more like Jesus? In his name, amen. Oh, just as we finish quickly, we're going to listen to a song together. Um, would you be able to turn that on soon? And while we're listening to that, we've got some questions to think through. Um, just to help you reflect on what you've heard and think about what do you need to go and do now? So the first question is, do you have certainty that you are saved? And secondly, what is it that gives you that certainty if it is there? And then thirdly, what will it look like to put your trust in Jesus? Let's listen to the song. Fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains.
now. Um, so we are going to leave the building after this. Um, something to think about though, you can have people round to your house. You can do hospitality at home and invite people round for a cup of tea and coffee and enjoy it there. And you can phone each other this afternoon. Um, so as we leave just now, we're all going to leave through the front door um, and we'll try and stagger how we leave. So just wait for one row to clear and then go out. Um, just so that we can maintain that two meter distance that we're trying to. And if the people in the back hall could please use the door on your left to go out rather than stepping through the middle, that would be really helpful. As we... Hmm? Yes, the offering box will be by that door as well. So if you've got money that you'd like to give, there will be a box there. Thank you very much, Bill. There's also one. I'll move it there. That's fine. Well, as we go out just now, we're going to finish with some words that we read in our Bible readings this week that just encourage us to have this confidence. From Romans 8, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.